Amen. Everyone, Amen. please stand. We're going to begin to worship the Lord. I just want to praise you. Your 
mercy. And we thank you for your forgiveness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. say welcome it says invocation but it's okay to welcome people we're welcoming in the Holy Spirit who has preceded us here but God wants us to officially just welcome you Lord we welcome your presence we welcome you into the service we welcome you into our hearts we thank you for using us in through song through scripture through the preached word through testimonies in whatever way that you see fit and we dedicate our service to you father in Jesus name amen I'm going to ask you to stand one last time. One last time. We're just going to read through our psalm of praise taken from the 62nd psalm. We'll begin with the first verse. It says, read with me. Truly my soul silently waits for God. From him comes my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense I shall not be greatly moved. My soul waits silently for God alone, for my expectation is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. In God is my salvation and my glory. The rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. God has spoken once. Twice I have heard this, that power belongs to God. Also to you, O Lord, belongs mercy, for you render to each one according to his work. Amen. You may be seated. We're not just reading the Psalms just for the fun of it. But we want to get the message and understand that the psalmist is saying at this point that power belongs to God, and that's who we should put our trust in. Sometimes we want to put our trust in ourselves, we put our trust in other institutions, and we're going to fail if we do that. We want to put our trust in God. Amen. Um, our song of praise today is a song called In Him. If we don't move in Jesus, we cannot move at all. Jesus is our source of life. Without him we would fall. In him we move, in him we live, and in him Might as well not start to move if we don't move in him. If we don't have the spirit, we cannot reach a soul. Jesus is our
that is the theme of the uh, service today, of the sermon. Moving in Jesus, moving in him. Knowing that if we don't move in him, uh, <laughs> we're lost. So uh, I've been preaching on 1 Samuel. There's a series that I'm doing uh, each time I preach. Um, Re Reverend Troop was going to be preaching today, but he had a death uh, in the family. Yesterday was a funeral. Um, uh, anyway, so it was easier just, I said, I'll just swap Sundays uh, with you, and he'll be preaching again next week. So I know I taught uh, last week, also teaching this week, uh, the series is titled The Path to Anointing God's Leader. That's what they're doing in the book of Samuel. They're looking for a leader, and each chapter is a lesson on how to choose the right leader. I don't know if you remember, but they chose the wrong one and had to deal with the consequences. So I'm just telling you what happened in the Bible. If the Holy Spirit speaks to your ear and so you think, oh, that might apply, that's, I'm, not, I'm just preaching the Bible. <laughs> I'm just telling you, here's what the Bible says. So hopefully you don't get mad at me later. And why did you say that? Because that's what the Bible said. So they, taught, they, they, they picked the wrong leader. We want to avoid that in life, just in general. Whatever we're, whenever we're choosing a leader for anything, you want to, we want to move with God. And so they eventually got the right leader because God gets his way in the end. But they had to learn a lesson first. So um, uh, let's go to the next slide. I want to start, and then I'll tell you what the title of the lesson is. But in, in Samuel chapter 4, so this is a fourth lesson we're in the fourth chapter, it says, and the word of God, no, I'm sorry, and the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now, I'm just stopping there. Last week, uh, Samuel was anointed, or two weeks ago, Samuel had been anointed at the time he was a child in the temple, and he began to hear God's voice. It was a rare thing, the Bible says, at that time because no one had been consulting God. It's not that God's not speaking. because Jesus said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. But if we don't open the door, he's just still there knocking. It's not that Jesus is not there. It's that we're not letting him in. So the rare word of God was rare at that time only because they weren't consulting him. So God speaks to Samuel, and Samuel actually says, yes, Lord, I'm listening. And God begins to speak to him. And then it's saying now the word of Samuel went to all Israel, that God spoke to him. However, they did not listen to Samuel. So God can speak through somebody. It doesn't mean people will listen to that person. So the next slide says, um, here's this bonus. This is just bonus. God always has a messenger in place. God always has someone that he's speaking through. Samuel was not officially the king he was not officially, he had not been elected. They, they hadn't voted him in yet or ordained him or anything like that. But God was still speaking through him. So whether it's official or not, whether you can point to the day this person was ordained or licensed or elected, God never leaves his people without someone that he's speaking through to reach the people. At this point, it was Samuel. They were not listening to him, but that's not because God wasn't speaking. So does that make sense? So we don't have to ever wonder, oh, no, this is a time period where we don't have guidance and we're just wandering in the wilderness and we have no idea what's going on. There's not one time in the Bible when God left his people without someone that he was speaking through. The difference is, are we listening, right? Okay, so here's the next verse. I mean, the next part of that verse says, now Israel went out to battle against the Philistines and encamped beside Ebenezer, and the Philistines encamped in Aphek. So the Philistines are in Aphek, and, the, and Israel's over here, and they're at Ebenezer. It wasn't named Ebenezer at the time. It was named Ebenezer a little bit later. But he's just saying, you remember Ebenezer. Like some of you might have grown up on Santa Barbara Avenue back when it was Santa Barbara Avenue by the Coliseum. It's now Martin Luther King Boulevard. So you might say, I grew up in Martin Luther King Boulevard. Really, you grew up in Santa Barbara Avenue. <laughs> Or you grew up in Exposition, now it's Obama Boulevard, hallelujah. But you grew up in Exposition. So you might have just used the current name, and that's what they're using, the current name. 
So it says they went out to battle against the Philistines. Did God tell them to go? No. Did Samuel tell them to go? No. Did they ask Samuel? No. They just went because they saw a problem that needed to be corrected, and they believed they had the answer, so they went to fix it. Uh, here's the problem. So the title of the sermon, I think this is the next, script, the next slide. Oh, sorry. So here's what happened. So they go out to battle. It says, then the Philistines put themselves in battle array against Israel, and when they joined the battle, so the Philistines come in, when they joined the battle, Israel was defeated by the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 men of the army in the field. So they went to battle and they lost. 4,000 people were killed in this battle. So here's the title of the lesson. Nine ways to avoid getting ahead of God. They got ahead of God. It wasn't that God never wanted them to fight that battle. 20 years later, they fight that battle and win. But they were 20 years ahead of God. They saw a problem. The Philistines are here, and they took it upon themselves to solve it. But when to solve it is just as important as how you're solving it. God has a timing, too. I know we don't think so, but he does, right? That messed up Abraham. God said, Abraham, I'm going to give you a son. Abraham got impatient and because Sarah wasn't getting pregnant. God had a timing of when Sarah was going to get pregnant. But Abraham said, I can't wait. Hey, uh, what was the, not Rahab, uh, Hag, Hagar, thank you. <laughs> uh, come here, Hagar, and we're going to solve this problem for God because God is slow. Right. Well, he's, he's, he, I wasn't there, but it was something like that. Mom, you were there. What did he say? No, I'm just kidding. Okay. So, um, so you can get ahead of God. All right. So, uh, let's look at the next slide. So when the people had come into the camp, the elders of Israel said, why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? They asked the right, like, what happened? Why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Here's what's interesting about that. Here's rule number one. Know who was standing in your way. They said, why has God defeated us? You have to know, because sometimes we blame the devil for stuff, and it's God the one stopping the program. It's God the one that put the halt to what we were doing, and we're trying to defeat it and pray against it. And God's like, why are you trying to pray? It's me. Hello? You're trying to pray against me. I'm slowing you down because it's not time yet. Timing is just as important as the plant when to take care of something. So these are nine ways to avoid getting ahead of God. So first got to know who it is that's standing in the way. Uh, here's an example. You remember that um, Balak gets on his donkey and he's going, um, and, and, and the donkey keeps trying to stop. In Numbers chapter 22, verse 32, it says, And the angel of the Lord said to him, Why have you struck your donkey these three times? Behold, I have come out to stand against you, because your way is perverse before me. I'm the, it's me. Hello. I'm the one stopping this. We really think it's the government, or really, but sometimes it's the Lord, and we've got to identify who it is, because otherwise we end up hitting the donkey. And the donkey, it's not the donkey's fault that's not working. How come this hasn't happened sooner? How come you didn't do this? Why did it? And we're beating the donkey. I'm trying. Why are you? And God's like, it's me, because you're not going down the right path, or you're ahead, or there's something wrong. So let's not always assume it's the devil. We mess up when it's the devil. God takes credit for so many things in the Bible. That's me stopping you. So first, know who it is that's standing in the way. Okay, next. So we're still in 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 3. So they say, the elders get together and say, let us bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord from Shiloh to us. That'll solve it. They don't pray. They don't stop. Lord, what it is. They already have the answer. I already know what to do. We'll go get the ark and we'll bring it to Shiloh. We'll bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord from Shiloh to us. So let's see what the next slide say. Know your job or risk demotion. They weren't over the ark. That wasn't their thing to go and get. They had not been assigned to the ark. The priests were taking care of the ark. Eli was a judge. He was supposed to guard the ark. No one was supposed to touch the ark but the priests. But they said, it's having little disregard for the office of the priest. Well, anyone could do that. 
And a lot of times we think anyone can do that. People have various jobs that they've been assigned, and not anybody can do it. We're wrong when we just assign anybody to anything. Let's vote this person in, and let's put that. Everybody has a different skill. The priests specifically have been assigned to the ark, but other people had other jobs. But they said, we'll go get the ark. We don't need the priests. And we make a mistake when we have little disregard for certain people's offices. If you don't understand what your job is, God will eventually demote you from the job he's given you because you're trying to do somebody else's job. We would call that staying in your lane. I, I heard that first from the prophetess Lisa Thomas. Stay in your lane. And that's what we have to do, right? Stay in our lane. Now, I just want to give you this example. Let's say somebody called me up and said, hey, I want you to bring some people out here, and we're going to build a home for the homeless. We're going to take this area, and we build this home, so I need carpenters and painters and all these things. So I'm going to give you the directions so you'll know how to find it. And I want you to come next week because that's when we'll be ready. So I know when it's happening. I know how to get there. But that's not the job. The job is the building, right? So I call up people. We get in the car. I've got the directions, and I know when we're supposed to go. But they start arguing about, well, I think we should go this way, and maybe we should go that. And I've got the directions. Now, me having the directions does not make, make me more important than anybody. That's just my assignment. I know how to get there. I know where we're supposed to go. But when we get there... We need Larry to paint, and we need Ollie to build, and we need this person to call people up and gather people in, and we need the, we need the people to finance it. We need all the different people. That's what's important once we get there. But I might be the one with the directions. I know where we're going. And sometimes we can waste time when people are all saying, well, I think we should do this, and here's how we get there, and this is where we should be going. And, and God gives the minister whoever that person is. He gives the leader, whoever that person is, of whatever organization, right? Whatever you've been put in charge of, God will give that leader the vision for where it should go, but then he gives everybody else in the car with their job, which is just as important. It's, they're equally important. Knowing where we're going is not more important than when we get there, how to build it. It's not more important. But sometimes people give it that importance. Ooh, you got the directions. Everyone has a different assignment, and the leader will know where we're going. They have the vision. So in this case, the leader knew about the ark, and they had this. They said, Psst, we don't need the priest. We can just go get that ourselves. How easy is that? So we'll go get the ark, and we'll bring it down here next. So here's their plan. So that when it comes among us, it may save us from the hand of our enemies. So we know... When, when we bring that ark down here, we're good. The enemy's going to try to attack, and we know what God's going to do. He'll save us. If we just have that ark, it will save us. But I think this is rule number two coming up. Oh, three, God will not perform at our command. We can't do a holy thing and then think God's going to just jump to it. We'll just have a service. We'll just have a song. We'll just have a script. We'll just do something, and that'll make God do it. God, does, if God has ordained it, then he'll do it. But if he is not, he's not going to do it. We can't make God do anything. But that's what they thought. We'll do it. We'll just make God do it. Uh, so I think here's why. Here's why they thought this. Uh, no, here's an example of somebody thinking they can just make God do something, right? Uh, Paul had been praying for people and laying hands on the sick, etc. God's doing all these miracles. It says, then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists thinking about themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, we exercise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Next. Oh, so you know what happened to them, right? They got beat up, stripped naked. <laughs> the person said, Paul, I know. Jesus, I, I don't know who you are. God's not going to do it just because you said to do it. I, I, you can't imitate something and make God do something that he has not decided he's going to do. So just because it worked in the past doesn't mean it's going to work today. We love that. Ooh, you know what we used to do is do that. So let's do that again, and that'll work. Here's the, here's the reason why they went to get the ark. 
because it had worked in the past. 200 years earlier, it had worked that way. So they thought, we can get God to do it that way again. We'll just make him do it. We'll do the same thing. And if you do the same thing, it'll work, right? Because, you know, God is stuck on repeat. And so if you just do the same thing, God will give the same result. So here's, here's remember this, uh, when they were in Jericho, they were marching around Jericho. Then Joshua, the son of Nun, called the priest and said to, the priest and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Ark of the Lord. Now, they had never done this before. It was new. We're just going to take the Ark and we're going to march around. And they're like, what? That made no sense to them. But yes, do it. Take the Ark. You won't have to fight. Just take the Ark and I'll fight for you. Is there another verse? Okay. So the people sent to Shiloh that they might bring from there the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of Host who dwells between the cherubim. So because it had worked in the past, right? They walked around seven times and then they blew the trumpet and then the walls fell down. So if we want to defeat the Philistines, let's just do that. Let's break out those old robes because when we had the old robes, the church was full and people were getting saved. It wasn't the robes that saved people. Is that news? The robes didn't, it wasn't the robes. It was God. It actually wasn't the ark. It was God. It was their obedience to do what God told them to do in the moment. God may tell everybody to wear purple one day, and then 40 people get saved. So we decide, let's have the annual wearing purple day. And then every year, we'll all wear purple, and people will get saved. And, but that doesn't work that way. And we're like shocked. Like, what happened? Well, you're wearing the wrong color purple. Well, no, God didn't tell you to do that again. You made it an annual day. You decided to do it over and over and over again, think you get the same results. It worked because we were obedient to do what God told us to do at that time. But now we've got to listen for a fresh revelation from God. But they went and they got the ark. They brought it down. So the people sent to Shiloh, which is where God had told them to keep it, put the priest in charge of it, that they might bring from there the ark of the covenant of the Lord of the host who dwells between the cherubim. So the, now, you may not... I mean, why would you know? Because, tell me if I'm describing this right. Uh, so, no, I'm kidding. So, the ark was, looked like a coffin, and it had two angels on either side and a seat in the middle, the mercy seat. So, the covenant of the Lord of hosts who dwells with the cherubim, he said, build the ark in a certain way, and I will come sit there and on the mercy seat. It's called the mercy seat. Now, they were totally using the ark in the wrong way. There were, there's a, and I've heard it taught, I would say, incorrectly, not on purpose. No one teaches on purpose incorrectly. But let's really examine the ark and what it was about. Okay, so the next scripture. So God will not bless what he has not ordained. God hasn't ordained it. He's not going to bless it. So getting that ark and, and the presence of the Lord, nothing's going to happen. If God has not ordained it, right? So uh, we're going to check out the ark and we're going to see exactly what God put in it and why. So first of all, 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 4 says, The two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the ark of the covenant of God. They're there with the ark. They're the wrong people to be over the ark, but they're there, and they let them take the ark. Actually, they went with the ark. Sure, we'll do this, and you can talk people into stuff that's not godly. You can talk godly people into stuff that's not godly because we don't necessarily check the Bible. They shouldn't have touched the ark. They should not have moved the ark. They didn't understand what the ark was about. They just thought it's something holy. Listen, holiness without inspiration is ineffective, it's meaningless. So just doing something holy, but God hasn't told you to do it, has not inspired you to do it, his presence is not there. You can do a holy thing just to do it. Let's just read a scripture. Why? Just because it's time to read a scripture. Not because your heart is moving you and you want to, you can take communion and have no connection to it. Just do it because, oh, it's time for communion. And and then they say, don't do it unless you really examine yourself. 
You see, we need to do the holy things that God has given us out of sincerity and understanding what they're about. But just doing it just to do it, it's going to mess us up. So Phineas and Hophni went with him, right? So I think this is where I start to examine, I think, um, hopefully they're there, those scriptures. If you don't learn the lesson, ah, here it is, you will have to repeat the class. So there was a lesson in the ark, and we want to discuss what was in the ark and why they should not have touched it. If you don't learn the lesson, you have to repeat the class. If you're going to use Hophni and Phineas, and you know they're a mess, you're in trouble. If that's who you have leading you. Okay, so let's, now I think we're going to examine the ark. Exodus chapter 25, God takes Moses up into the mountain. After they've come out of Egypt, he takes Moses up into the mountain. He's going to give them the Ten Commandments. But he says, you shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark. He's describing first this ark and the mercy seat because he already knows what they're going to do. He already knows they're going to mess up. And in the ark, you shall put the testimony that I will give you, which is the Ten Commandments. So that was the first thing because there's three things that's in the ark. They should not have gotten the ark. They should not have touched the ark. There are three things in the ark. First, the Ten Commandments. So he's going to, you're going to put the Ten Commandments in the ark. So do you remember what happened with the Ten Commandments here in the next verse? Moses turned and went down from the mountain after he's got the Ten Commandments, and the two tablets of the testimony are in his hand. He says, the tablets were written on both sides. On the one side, another side, they were written, right? God, had, he wrote really big. So he could only fit five on one side and five on the other. God didn't write small. So then, so it was as soon as he came near the camp, this is Moses, that he saw the calf and the dancing. So even though Moses was going up to get the law of God, the people were downstairs cutting up because they lost patience. They wanted, because Moses was gone for 40 days. It's like, well, it's been 40 days. So if you can't get it done in 40 days, then I'm moving on. So they had moved on. They're dancing. They're ready to go back. They had built a calf so they can go back to Egypt. Like we, I know we prayed for 200 years to get out of Egypt, but uh, we want to go back. And people want to go back to Egypt. Lord, deliver me from this drink until they get stressed out. And then they want to go back to that same bar that they asked God to deliver them from. Lord, deliver me from this person who is so horrible to me. But as soon as they get lonely, they go back to that person, right? We go back to Egypt really quickly, really fast. So they were ready to go back to Egypt. So he sees it. So Moses' anger became hot, and he cast the tablets out of his hands, and he broke them at the foot of the mountain. So the tablets that were put into the ark, the first thing that was put in the ark, was out of anger because people had messed up, and God wanted them to remember, wanted them to remember how they had messed up. Look how you messed up. And I had to give you these commandments, and Moses had to break them. I want those to get, go in the ark as a reminder to not break my rules, to respect my rules. So I want you to carry those broken tablets around with you. I want you to carry the tablets. They, God made them some new ones. But I want you to carry the tablets around with you so that you can remember to listen to my voice and not break my rules. Next. So this is the second thing. That goes in the tablet. My, my, okay, there we go. My phone, my, my pocket just dialed my Facebook page and was playing a song. Okay, so speak to the children of Israel and get from them a rod from each father's house. All their leaders, according to their father's houses, 12 rods, write each man's name on his rod. So there are 12 tribes that had come out. They had taken one leader. These are the elders. They represented, like we have month groups. They represented 12 tribes. But they were all challenging Moses and Aaron's leadership. And so he says, get a rod from each one of them and write his man's name on their rod. So we're going to know which one is Aaron's rod. Next. Then he says, and the Lord said to Moses, bring Aaron's rod back before the testimony to be kept as a sign against the rebels. So the next morning when they looked at the rods, Aaron's rod had budded. It had grown flowers. And that was God's sign that I've chosen this person as a leader. You're not respecting my leader. First, you didn't expect my rules. 
now you're not respecting the leader that I chose you. So he says, I want you to take that rod back before the testimony. Put it, because the testimony is already in the ark. I want you to put that in the ark too to be kept as a sign against the rebels. So in the ark is something that's showing, look how angry I was at you. I want you to remember how, how bad you were, and I want you to carry this around with you. It's like um, this wonderful mother who got in trouble. Um, I think her child got a fail in some class because they decided to play hooky from school. So she wrote a sign and had the child stand outside carrying the sign. Like, I decided it was more important to, play, you know, play video games than it, and because I want you to remember, I want you to be embarrassed because you thought it was more important to do that than to get a good grade. I was paying for your education. I thought you were going every day and you were playing hooky. And there are people like, oh, that's terrible to embarrass the child. It's, no, it's not. I want you to remember what you did so that you don't do it again. So in this case, put the rod in the ark so they'll remember what they did and they won't do it again. So to be kept as a sign against the rebels that you may put their complaints away from me lest they die. Because if they don't remember, I have to, I'm going to come back and it's going to be worse next time. So two things in the ark so far. The, tap, the commandments they broke and the rod where they challenged my leadership. Here's the third thing in the ark. And the children of Israel said to them, to Moses and Aaron, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the pots of meat and when we ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. So they've been begging to leave Egypt. They come out. Here's what God was going to do. Every day it was going to be a new mercy, you know, morning by mercy, new mercies I see. They were going to show up and there'd be elk. And then the next day there'd be pheasant. And then the next day there was going to be cows running by with just dropping steak on the way and barbecue chicken running past. Every day was going to be a new thing. Pizza just showing up out of nowhere. Every day. They got there. They didn't see the provision because God was going to do something wonderful. And so they complained, oh, we should have died back in Egypt. You just brought us out here to kill us. So here's what Aaron and Moses said to back to them. Um, and in the morning, so, so he tells them, I can't stop my phone from, I won't remember that it's there. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, for he hears your complaints against the Lord. But what are we that you complain against us? You realize that you're complaining against the Lord. You're complaining against us, but really you're complaining against the Lord. You're thinking that God's not going to provide. So here's what he's going to do. Then Moses said, this is the thing which the Lord has commanded. Fill an omer with it to be kept for your generation. I'm going to give you manna. I'm going to give you the same thing every day for 40 years. Every day, the same thing. I was going to give you a new thing every morning. But now I'm just going to give you the same thing for 40 years. The same thing. As punishment. You'll see it in the morning. When you get up, it'll already be there. Just collect it. No surprises because you can't wait. You're so impatient. So when you get up in the morning, there'll be this white wafer stuff. Just take it and eat it. For 40 years, every single day, the same thing. And if you take too much, it'll turn to worms. I'm going to give you the same thing. But I want you to put an omer of it in a jar. Fill an omer with it. That's a jar, right? Put, put some in a jar to be kept for your generations that they may see the bread with which I fed you in the wilderness. When I brought you out of the land of Egypt, I want, this is what I fed you with for 40 years. That's your punishment. So there's three things going in the ark. You broke my rules, so put the tablet in there. You challenged my leader, so put the rod in there. You challenged my provision, so I want you to put some manna in that ark and carry it around with you as a reminder of your rebelliousness, of your impatience, and your refusal to listen to me. So this is the thing that they decided to go get in the battle when they weren't listening to God. We're, they went to battle. God didn't send them to battle. I know. Let's go get the ark. That'll make God happy. It's the opposite. Don't go get the ark. That's the symbol of you rebelling. Have you not learned the lesson? That's why I put a mercy seat on top of it. Because it was my mercy that kept me from burning you up. So I want the priest to go and 
drop the blood, and I will show up and I'll receive your sacrifice and atone for your sin. This is the atonement seat, the mercy seat to atone for your mistakes. Don't make another mistake and use the thing that I taught you to make a mistake with. That doesn't make any sense. You're using the thing that I'm trying to teach you not to make a mistake to make a bigger mistake. So if we don't learn the lessons, we're going to be in trouble. I saw a picture the other day of the church that stood here on this corner that burned. Um, and everything is black all around. The pulpit's there and the Bible is on it. Know who did that. Who burned up that church? The Lord. What did he leave? The Bible. What does he want us to focus on? The word. I'm going to burn it all up, but I'll leave the Bible. So 40 years later, because that was October of 1982. It is October 2022. It's 40 years almost in October, it'll be 40 years to the day since God burnt the church and left the Bible. Are, have we learned the lesson? Are we going to be those Israelites? Are we going to listen and make the Bible the center of everything that we do? Or are we going to have to learn the lesson again? Next. So. And when the ark of the Lord, when the ark of the covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all of Israel shouted so loudly that the earth shook. They were so excited. Why were they so excited? Do, do I have a verse about uh, what happened in, in uh, Joshua? Oh, good. So back then it says, and the seventh time it happened when the priests blew the trumpet. Remember they're walking around Jericho that Joshua said to the people, shout for the Lord's giving you the city. So they shouted and the walls came down. So when they brought the ark, which they weren't supposed to touch, they all shouted because that's what they did last time. See how that worked? Last time it worked, we all shouted. So they, had, they shouted so much that the earth shook. They had, the organ was going, the tambourine people running around the church, ah, screaming, having a good time. Did that impress God? Did that make God do anything? No. Here's, I think, our next rule. Enthusiasm cannot replace obedience. So we can get as excited as we want. We can shout and have a great time, but if we're not doing what God asks us to do, it's not going to make any difference. God's not impressed by our noise. He's not impressed by how excited we are. We can shout and have the best service and totally be out of God's will the entire time. Shouting and making a joyful noise to the Lord and having 15, you can have 15 choirs up here. We need more choirs. We need more obedience. We mean nor following after God. You could have 15 choirs of here. That won't, God's not going to bless that if he didn't ordain that. We could have drums and organ and a church full of people. It doesn't mean that we're doing what God asked us to do. So they shouted so loud that the earth shook. In fact, the Philistines heard them and went, oh my, what's going on there? Their, their God must have shown up. And that got the Philistines more excited. Well, we better bulk up now and put on extra. And they came down and beat the mess out of them. Next verse. Next. So the Philistines fought and Israel was defeated. And every man fled to his tent. There was a very great slaughter and there fell of Israel 30,000 foot shoulders. So the first time they did, they lost 4,000. Let's go get the ark. That'll make God do what we want him to do. Brought the ark down. Now they lost 30,000. Because they never stopped to pray. They already knew the answer. Thank you to all the people who already know the answers. You don't have to pray. You're blessed above all people. When it's not working, you know what's wrong. People will tell you real quick what's wrong. But I'm not sure God told them that. And sometimes we can see a problem, but we didn't, may not know the real way to fix it if we are not spending time in prayer. We want to solve things our way. Let's do this. What we, should, what we ought to be doing is doing that. Are you sure? Let's take time and fall on our face before God. Because that's what the children of Israel back in Joshua's day, after they shouted and God gave them the city, the very next week they went to battle and lost. They didn't go grab the ark. 
they fell on their faces and they repented and they prayed. And God said, here's the problem. You were not obedient. I told you not to touch anything. And you sent that guy in and he grabbed this stuff. And, and you need to get the sin out of the camp. There's sometimes sin in the camp, disobedience in the camp. And that's what needs to be rooted out before God's going to give us victory. So we can shout all we want and do all the holy things we want. But until we look inside and see what it is that God wants us to deal with. I don't know what it is. I'm just putting out what I see in the Bible. When they prayed, when they repented, it seems that God gave them an answer. When they thought they already knew what to do and how to fix it, and we, we, that's when they lost. You can get ahead of God in fixing a problem, so we need to slow down and make sure we're not ahead of him. Because it may be God is stopping us. It's not something else. Maybe God is saying slow down. So they lost 30,000 foot soldiers. Next. So knowing what to do and knowing when to do it are equally important in God's eyes. So it's not just enough. We need to fit. Yes, but when is God wanting us to do that? Because sometimes we are just in too much of a hurry and this is not, a, if God has told you to go, then you need to go. Then you're going to get in trouble for not doing it. But don't just assume that God is saying, go right now. There is a gift to knowing when God wants to do something. And if we get in a hurry with any of this, if we get in a hurry, and again, that's the problem. I am not making this, I'm not campaigning for anything. They were in a hurry. That's why they lost God had not told them to do that yet. 20 years later, and I'm not saying you always have to wait 20 years, they fought the Philistines and won. It took 20 years. That's when God was going to do it. So I'm just saying it's not always great to set a date. We got to have this done by the 15th. Why? Did God say that? If God said that, for sure, but you please let me know that God said that because if we get ahead of him, he's going to mess it up. None of it's going to work. So knowing when to do something is just as important as knowing what to do. Next scripture. So now his daughter-in-law. Uh, so Eli dies. It says, now his daughter-in-law, Phineas' his wife, was with child. So there's Phineas and Hophni are brothers. The daughter-in-law is pregnant, and she's about to be delivered. It says, and when she heard the news that the ark of God was captured. So that's what happened. They took the ark. And that her father-in-law and her husband were dead. Eli, who should have stopped them, was dead. Her husband, who should not have let them take the ark, died. The brother died, and the Philistines ended up taking the ark. Not only did 30,000 people, but they took the ark. God let them take that ark because they hadn't learned the lesson. The lesson was, don't get ahead of God. The lesson was, don't break my rules. Don't. Don't challenge my leadership. Don't challenge my provision. Put me first. If we don't move in Jesus, we cannot move at all. We sing, you know, we move in him, but then we forget about him and just run off and do our own thing. So Phineas died. Hophni, the brothers died. Eli, the judge, died. Samuel's still back there saying, I told you not to do, you guys aren't listening to me. The elders who had a meeting who had a job, but their job was not to take the ark. The ark was not their job. They had other jobs that they were supposed to do, but they got out of their lane. They're wondering what happened. We've lost the ark. It says her father-in-law and her husband were dead, and she bowed herself and gave birth, for her labor pains came upon her. The next scripture about her. And she said, the glory has departed from Israel, for the ark of God has been captured. So now what are we going to do? Now the ark is gone. And she named her child Ichabod, which means the glory is gone. So here's rule number nine, the final rule. Presumption, pride, and thirst for power provoke God to periodically remove his presence. Presumption, thinking that the people who think they know everything, they will not listen. You can get up and say, well, I think, well, I don't care what you think. Okay. But God might be speaking through me. Are you, you just know everything? There are people who are so quick to argue and presume that they know the answer to everything and what's wrong. That's called presumption. We don't have, none of us have the gift of all power. It's okay to give an opinion. 
but it's not okay to knock somebody else's down, you may be wrong. So just listen to someone else. They may have something for you. Presumption, pride is why we don't listen. Pride is why we, we have to defend ourselves without ever waiting. Because we, it's, it, no, I know I'm right and you're wrong and I don't want to hear from you. And thirst for power. The elders said, we, we're not going to wait for the priests to do what they're supposed to do. We're going to take that person's job and do it because we want to be in power. But these are the things that periodically provoke God. He'll remove his presence. And then where we are without his presence. The glory of God left. It left. So they were on their own for 20 years. And the next time I preach, we'll get into chapter 5 and 6 and 7 of what happened to the Philistines because they took what should, they should not have taken. But meanwhile, the people of God were left without the tangible presence of God. And if we're not careful, we'll be in that same place. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness, for your mercy, that you did give a mercy seat for us. We thank you that you did preside over our failures when we messed it up, when the children of Israel messed up. You sent your presence to provide an atonement for it. So we're not going to be perfect, Lord, but help us to truly bury our pride and not get ahead of you, not make the same mistakes. These words are written in this Bible for our admonishment so that we can learn from it. They're not just there so we have a scripture to read before a meeting. But these words are there in the scriptures that we can learn who you are, how you move, what you do and what you require of us. So help us to be those that truly understand you and glory that we know you because we understand who you are and what you want from us so that we can follow you, not try to lead you, but let you be the shepherd and we'll be the sheep that follow your will. So help us, Lord, be all that we can be in you. Because if we don't move in you, then we shouldn't move at all. And Father, we give you glory for all things that you will accomplish in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, um, we are going to be dismissed in just a few minutes. If, if we have any visitors, anyone who's visiting for the first time with us, we just want to acknowledge you. If there's anyone here who's for the first time. And also, we want to welcome back those we haven't seen in a while. We're glad that you're here. Uh, I'm just pointing out because I just feel a love for you. I'm, we're all glad that you're here. You probably don't want the attention, but, but uh, I know God's brought you here to, to be with us, and your presence here blesses us. So thank you for worshiping with us. And anytime you can be here, we're delighted. And that's just for anybody who's here in the service. Anytime any of you are here, you bring God's presence with you because now he's in us not just sitting in a mercy seat. So we're glad and we like to welcome everybody. Yes, sir. Is that Maurice? I can't see with the mask on. Maurice, it's so good to see you. We're so good to see you. We love you. If I had known that was, it's the mask is covering up three-fourths of your face. So it's just the forehead. I mean, that's okay. But you know if I'd... See, you know you're up there singing. So next time I, you walk in, just be, unless you're ducking and hiding, just have a song ready. So we're just, thank you, thank you, AJ, for pointing him out. Um, and, and if I'm missing anyone else, because we want to, anyone who hasn't been here in a while or anything like that, we do want to make sure we acknowledge you. So thank you so much, because I'll, I'll miss. Okay, just quickly, our, our announcements, we... We'll have an offering at the end of the service. Some of you are wonderfully um, you taking advantage of the online giving, which is an excellent thing. Um, and it's our, our it's goodshepherdmbcla.com. And you go there, there's a green button that talks about online giving. So if you're watching from home or, or you just happen to tune in and God moves in you, you want to give $5, $10, whatever it is, then we appreciate that. You're giving, and, and this is a way for all of us to give without worrying about having to bring a lot of money to church. But if you brought money to church, again, at the end of the service, we're going to come forward, and then we're going to go, and there'll be someone collecting the money. 
Are the, the, are the little ushers here today? Nope. Okay. So we'll acknowledge them at a different time. Um, so the other announcements, the pastor search meeting is Tuesday, uh, September 21st. It was the 20th. It was accidentally said the 21st, but it is on the 20th at 530. And we think that the, um, we want you to be here in person, but we think that the, the Zoom will be working better. We, we will have an, uh, something in there to help the Wi-Fi working. Also, the, uh, the church clothes donation will, is on the 21st. And they said they'd be here between 11 and 1. So last week the announcement said you got to have it here before 10 a.m. and just leave it in the parking lot. But there'll be people from the Western Baptist State uh, Convention here between 11 and 1. Uh, you can bring it by if you, if you give it to a member or something. If you can't make it here during that time, if you have anything today or some, that you want to donate, that's, that's wonderful. But the clothes are being donated for the abused women who are being taken out of relationships that are really bad, and sometimes they, you just have to take them right out because it's a dangerous for them. They, the clothes that they're wearing are used as evidence, and they have to surrender those, and they can't go back into that situation. So the police have to find clothes for them, and someone has taken this on as their ministry that we're going to help provide, not just us, but all the churches, to provide clothing for women so when they're in that situation that they could put on something nice and go and look for a job or whatever it is that they need to do. So if you have some nice clothes that you'd like to donate, dresses, pants, suit, et cetera, um, that are in nice condition that you've dry cleaned or, you know, then we'll be collecting those on September 21st uh, between 11 and 1. Uh, okay, the next, um, on the 24th, though, on the Saturday the 24th is a luncheon here. They're asking for a $10 donation. There's food. It's between 9.30 and 1. Uh, you'll be able to sign up for medical equipment. I'll make a request for I need a wheelchair or I need bars put on my shower or I need a walker or different sort of medical equipment that you can apply for. If you know anybody who's in need of anything, then it will be, we'll provide, you'll be applying. You won't get it instantly, obviously, because they won't know what you want. But you can apply for it during that time. Um, you kept it three pairs of flip flop, but it said between one and three pairs. So you don't if you if you only had one, one they'd like they'd love you to bring a pair of flip flops. Uh, between one and three pairs also is a donation for the um, thing. And the clothes donation happened on the twenty first, but they'll be given out at that time. And also there's a toy distribution list people can sign up. Uh, if you don't if you know that you won't be able to provide this Christmas, then we want to help provide the Western Baptist State. Women would like to help to provide. So, yes, yes, I'm signing up to get toys. Um, and all that will be happening on Saturday between 9.30 and 1 o'clock. Uh, here's the final thing. Oh, I'm sorry. The 73rd church anniversary is next month. I think we're going to have it on the fourth Sunday. So it's our 73rd. Our 1949 was our first year. Um, so it's, we think we're going to celebrate it on the fourth Sunday. If anybody would like to join on the committee to help plan the, the um, service, well, not to actually plan the service. The service will be normal service. But uh, to help decorate or to help with refreshments afterwards, uh, then please let me know after church. If there's anybody uh, who's watching at home, uh, call me. I'll, I'm the chairman of that committee. So if you'd like to help in any way with the preparations for it, uh, then uh, it'll be on the fourth Sunday. You can let me know any time between now and then. And uh, also the Hispanic church, they're actually celebrating their 60th minute. That ministry started 60 years ago in a small, you know, ch uh, storefront. And it's been going for 60 years. And so that's why they have these flowers here today, these lovely flowers. Uh, at 3 o'clock, they're having their service. If you want to come back and celebrate with them, they're celebrating their 60th anniversary. And I think that's the final announcement. Oh, other than... Always Wednesday night Bible study. On Wednesday nights, we're going through the book of John. On Sundays in Sunday school, we're going through the book of Exodus. Uh, I just tend to go chapter by chapter through a book. So um, if you tune in on Wednesday night or on Sundays, um, we're, at any time, it's always, and they're always available on our website. When Carlos preaches, when James preaches, when the minister Johnson preaches, all those Sermons and things go on our website. All the Bible studies, everything is there. You can look at them at any time that you'd like. 
And I think that's the final thing. Is there anything else? Because I, I'll, I'll miss anything, so I don't want to. Um, is there anyone I'm looking uh, who wants, wants to come forward to join the church? Then he makes me sure that I open the doors of the church because we, and we'll pray with you if you'd like. Otherwise, we'll stand and please know that anytime the doors are open, not just always at the end of the service. If you, you could raise your hand in the middle of the sermon and say, I want to join. They're always open. So let's bow our heads. Father God, we thank you so much for your mercy, for your spirit. We thank you for all that you are teaching us, helping us to become more the Christian that you want us to be, not the one that we think we should be. So help us to stay in line with your word. Help us to have a thirst for your word. Help us to learn the lessons that we're supposed to learn so that we can be the church that you want, that you see us to be. And if there are any needs here that need to be met, healing, if there's financial needs, uh, relationship needs, if there's a lost child somewhere or, or someone that someone's worried about in this congregation, we're praying together now for that. You know what it is. So we don't have to say it out loud, but we are putting ourselves in agreement that those needs will be met. And so bless us, Father, as we go from this place so that we can be a shining light. Bless us and keep us safe until we all come together again. And now unto him who is able to keep you from falling, the only wise and true Savior, be all majesty, glory, and honor. In Jesus' name we pray.